started. Um, we are, I'm very excited to be speaking today with uh, Denise Ferreira da Silva. She is professor and director of the Social Justice Institute, JRSJ at the University of British Columbia, then the author of Toward a Global Idea of Race and Ajivida Impagabil. Her artistic collaborations include the films Serpent Rain and Four Waters Deep Implicacy with Arjuna Newman. So uh, we're going to start with some, I'm going to be asking Denise questions um, about the article that we read, Scene of Nature, but also more broadly about her work. Um, and we'll do that for about 45 minutes or so and then open up uh, for questions from everybody. So uh, Denise, are you, can you hear everything all right? Yes, I can hear you Perfect. very well. Wonderful. Well, um, I wanted to start because we were, uh, sorry, we had in our earlier email exchange, you talked about how you don't use the term um, racism, but rather other, other concepts that you've theorized, such as racial subjugation and racial violence. So I wanted to start by asking you if you could explain why you uh, made this decision in your work and what you understand these, what these concepts mean to you. Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Jennifer and Gabriel, for uh, the invitation to uh, speak to the critical theory um, group. And uh, nice to see you all in my wall, <laughs> my computer. <laughs> I hope you're all well, as well as one can be these times. Um, yes, um, to your question, what, um, I mean, there are, there are many reasons why I have decided not to use uh, racism as a, a driving concept in my work. Uh, many of them are generational, but so I'm not going to share with you because you know uh, <laughs> they are, they, are, they may be relevant, but not to, so much to our conversation here. So I'm going to mention two of them, which I don't think are generational. Um, are more, I think, conceptual, philosophical, even. Uh, the first one has to do with the fact that the term racism, as it, it was initially employed by, for instance, Hannah Arendt in The Origins of Totalitarianism, for instance, it signals an ideological or a cultural aspect that is usually written as exterior or anterior to the scene of modernity and all its cultural, economic, ethical, juridical aspects. So there are, descriptions of uh, racism or, and race connected to it as exterior uh, usually refer to the ways in which the colonial enterprise or, and or non-white peoples are not part of the history of capitalism proper or uh, in the case of non-white peoples are not, do not share um, you know, the same historical trajectory as Europe. And the argument of anteriority, you can see, for instance, in Cedric Robinson's uh, Black Marxism, in which he traced two um, kind of like two political, historical, cultural trajectories, one take, taking, place in, taking place in the colonies and another one in Europe. And he locates racialism in, you know, in feudal Europe. Uh, and, then, and then racialism then remains moralized and uh, unmodified throughout the history of capital. And, uh, and Foucault also, in his analysis of the discourse on races, also places uh, race and then connects state racism to that idea of race or to that discourse on, on races that prevailed in Europe also again, um, that came about in the Middle Ages or in the uh, feudal period. So, so this is uh, one, one reason. Now, my engagement with modern philosophy in toward the global idea of race, what I, I seek to do there is precisely to show how the racial, so I don't use the, I use race sometimes as a descriptor, but I usually use the concept of racial. How the concept of racial is a, it is a modern, it's a modern construct. Of course, it is a reformulation of a pre-existing category of race, but it's a reformulation that is done according to the rules of the modern team, so just to use um, Foucault's uh, term. Um, 
Now, the second reason, which is also related, uh, is because racism defined as anterior or exterior um, to modernity or post-enlightenment uh, Europe, it, it is also articulated within the discourse of progress or of overcoming. Uh, you know, this, this philosophical story that is told over and over again by different philosophers about how eventually liberal thought will, you know, take over and realize freedom and equality in everybody's mind. So those two, I mean, both of them, um, they, are, they are both crucial in, in, in different moments. Now, so in terms of the global idea of race, my general argument is that the racial is a political symbolic um, tool. So it's both historical and scientific concept according to the rules of the modern team. And what its, its deployment has occasioned was a mapping of the global space, which a mapping that produces human beings that stand differentially before the principles, the ethical principles that are said to rule in, um, in, post, in the post-enlightenment era. In particular, the principles that govern the notion of humanity, such as um, liberty and, uh, and dignity. So in some, so racial subject, subject, subjugation, as I use it, it allows me to refer to this symbolic moment um, but at the same time, also to the juridical, economic, and ethical uh, moments, modes of operation of, of the racial. And as such, it you know, covers um, all dimensions of social existence. Hi. Thank you so much. That was um, uh, really excellent excellent explanation of that i just to follow up um i just wanted to ask so would it be accurate to say that you would understand it as a kind uh, the racial as ideological as an ideology of uh, or set of ideologies related to ascriptive hierarchies um hmm, that that's that's a good <laughs> that's a good question I, because when in, in toward the global idea of race, I, I draw from Foucault and Derrida in my description of both uh, the conditions of emergence, production, and, uh, and the conditions of deployment of the racial, or what I, I call um, after Foucault again, um, the analytics of raciality. So in that sense, it's, I don't see it so much as ideological, but more in Foucault's sense of being productive of uh, modern subjects mm -hmm. um, in, that, in that sense. That's on the one hand. Now, on the other hand, um, of course, there is a, when, um, when we describe the operations of the racial or the operations of the tools of raciality, the descriptions always uh, refer to two mechanisms, right? One is exclusion. It's like, you know, zero one kind of um, logical uh, setup. And the other one is a higher, uh, the hierarchical element, which, you know, we, we identify within that zero one or one, two or AB kind of, kind of distinction. But I think I think that yes, but it's uh, the ratio is more fundamental because it's, it does not only uh, is deployed in the production or reproduction or articulation of hierarchies, but it's actually uh, deployed in the production or in the, in the description production of human beings that stand differentially uh, in regards to these concepts and that difference is not an, uh, um, a hierarchical one, it's a distinction that has to do with the life and death. Um, so the race, so one, one of my arguments in toward the global idea of race is that the racial actually produce modern subjects that stand uh, before the horizon of death. Um, and then, I mean, yeah, it operates. So what? Uh, one of the things that I identify 
is this uh, the operation of those two logics. There is a logic of exclusion, which is a logic that attends to hierarchies and exclusion discrimination, but that is also a logic of obliteration. And both of them operate simultaneously. And then if when you you attend that the role of the racial as a global, as it operates globally, since it uh, maps the global space, you'll see that the logic of obliteration um, prevails uh, over the logic of exclusion. I mean, even in the US, right? I mean, <laughs> as we <laughs> see over and over again. <laughs> Well, that kind of gets me, I mean, a, a bit more into some of the things I wanted to ask next, um, because I know that, so we, we um, read your article, Scene of Nature, and one of the reasons that you chose this article was because of its relevance to the current uprisings and the popular movement against racist and parastate violence, racist state and parastate violence. So I'd really like to hear your thoughts on the current conjuncture um, for example, what you think are the kinds of analyses that are most urgent and needed right now, and even to elaborate on, you know, what you were talking about, the way that we're seeing what is, what is you describe a kind of logic of obliteration at work. Um, so that's a long, very long question, right? <laughs> I can I can fail to answer it appropriately for a long time. And I say fail to answer because I think that none of us is in a, well, yeah, right now is in a good position of trying to come up with an analysis of the moment because it is the moment and I, and I think it's a very complex moment. Um, so I will, um, yeah, I'll try to answer the question um, slowly and, uh, and then you'll let me know if I, yeah, if I miss, if I miss something. So, but, Okay, so what we see, I, I have this more like, you know, what, what it's more of empirical. I, I would like to begin to describe it empirically, like lots of quotes, um, because, exactly because of what I said, like it's not, I, I don't feel comfortable theorizing the moment, even though I think, again, it's inescapable. But empirically, so when looking at the protests, for instance, at the uprisings, um, which are actually welcome. Uh, I was so afraid back in March that uh, that the, the the pandemic would totally shut up, shut off the uprisings we we saw happening. You know, just before it, not so much in the U.S., but uh, uh, in, I was following them in Latin America and, and other places. But in any case, so what I, what I see when I when I look at the images in the streets is like. Um, it, it's as if like Sanders, Bernie Sanders voters and Black Lives Matter activists finally met, right? To have been describing, talking about them separately as if the, the twins would uh, never meet. And, um, and I think what's one of the things that can be said about these, um, this moment, this, this convergence is how it highlights uh, the pair state capital. Um, I think, in a way, uh, the pandemic, um, the U.S. government's despicable response to, to it, and then it took a while, but then eventually we saw the racial configuration of the pandemics. I think that there is uh, this, um, I don't know, poignant, poignant uh, coincidence, right? which was very much expressed in the fact that the virus is a, you know, causes a respiratory disease and a disease that it's deadlier to black and, and, and Latinx persons in the US. And then the chokehold, right? This deadly police, policing strategy uh, that's used to subdue black and, and, and Latinx. Latinx people. So that combination, I think, uh, has a lot to, to, to say about why we see that convergence and why such, you know, such an uprising would have happened, even though I don't know that we could have anticipated it. Um, so on the, on the one hand, I see the uprisings in, 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 along those lines, right? And then I think, so one could, one could describe them as, like, as if like these two deadly elements of global capital, if we think that a global pandemic has so much to do with how now we, we move and live across um, borders so quickly. So this, 
these two deadly elements of, of global state capital um, are important to take into account. But then at the same time, uh, these uprisings are not something isolated. I think we can go back uh, to the mid 90s, beginning with the Zapatistas um, a rebellion against new liberal state capital. Um, and from there, we had the anti-globalization movements and, and you know, from the mid of the decade, um, thinking uh, about the Battle of Seattle in 1999, it seems that was, well, it was over 20 years ago, but it's not that long ago, the anti-Iraq war mobilizations of the 2000s and up to Occupy, right? So we have this long trajectory. And if we look um, at the, the composition and the strategies, they, they're very similar um, to, to those. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we have something that is different, which has to do with uh, the role of social media in this moment. And that's where Black Lives Matter um, come, I mean, came before, of course, Me Too, but the, the Me Too movement also grew out of that. So we have this, it's a very, I, I find it a very, a very complex um, set of, uh, set of uh, elements that come together to, to bring about, um, you know, I mean, I don't want to make a cause and effect connection, but, um, but this, 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 this particular conjuncture as, as any other, obviously, um, you know, forces us to think about all those elements. So the question is, how do we analyze that moment, right? How do we make sense of it um, in, um, you know, given that most of the elements, some, uh, most of them have been seen as disparate, uh, thinking about race, the racial and capitalism, it's something that very few of us have done, um, have, have, uh, have done in, in the past. And then at the same time, think about uh, political mobilization uh, that bring together both uh, the streets and social media. Of course, we do have been talking about it for a while now, but still I, I have yet to find um, an account that it's, um, that really uh, extracts and exposes and allows us to, to bring them together in a coherent and, and interesting and interesting way. Um, so I'm lost now. <laughs> I no, I think that I, I'd like to follow up on that because uh, I think that's a really important historicization of what's going on, of thinking of these uprisings within the kind of, you know, global uh, phenomenon of popular uprisings in the, that have occurred in the context of, you know, neoliberal globalization as a kind of ruling class onslaught or, you know, what's described as the Zapatistas described as the Fourth World War right of the war of capital against uh all of us and against the you know biosphere as well so i think that's really a great perspective to be thinking about these things and i think you know and even before night the uprising you know the zapatista uprising we have the la uprising which is similar and also takes you know which is both the kind of uprising of the um racialized and transnational working and workless poor in la um or the Caracaso, and then the series of, rise, of uprisings in Latin America that we see. And I'd actually like to ask you, because you mentioned that you've been following um, these in Latin America, if you had any other you know, thoughts about that or the kind of particular contours that you're seeing, um, either in terms of the popular rebellions or in terms of the kind of uh, way that dispossession and state violence um, are you know mutually uh, interdependent in other political cultures that you know beyond the U.S. Yeah, well, I think that what we were looking at in Latin America in the past year was it was a, a little bit of a, a like a little bit of fresh air be, because it was exactly after the election of Bolsonaro in Brazil and then the U.S. Um, uh, the U.S., how do you describe it? 
um, imperial moves towards Venezuela, mm -hmm. right? That was that initial mobilization, I remember, I think was beginning of, 2000, of 2018 or 19, I can't even remember when Bolsonaro uh, started this, this nightmare has been going on. Mm -hmm. Feels like forever, but that was that was I I was afraid that uh, many of us were afraid that the the conservative backlash in Latin America was going to uh, basically um, make any kind of mobilization of, of of mobilization from the left of popular um, mobilization impossible. But then at the same time as that was happening, we also saw that precisely because of the return of the right, many of, uh, of, the, of the policies, many, many of um, you know, the, the, the policies that would benefit global financial capital, that for instance, in Brazil, the Dilma administration didn't even go there, even though the Dilma administration went far, you know, far away from the left <laughs> in many of its decisions, in particular in, in regards to extraction in the Amazon. But then with the return the, that, that conservative back backlash, I, th I think, okay, so that conservative backlash on the one hand, um, which uh, in a way um, furthered uh, the levels of dispossession um, in, 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 in Latin America, on the one hand, and then on the other hand, I think the, the left, left oriented governments, their political, their, their the policies for social inclusion and poverty uh, alleviation, thinking about Brazil, we, we talk about 15 years, more or less 15 years. Those policies had an effect in terms of what then became possible in the horizon of, polit of political possibilities, right? So in a way you have this these movement that seemed, that was a movement over uh, some, some years, which seemed that finally some, the most, um, how do I say, the most violent expressions of dispossession in Latin America were being addressed badly without the problems, you know, that w w in Brazil we saw the um, workers' party uh, administrations. And then you have these, um, you know, these, these, these turn to the right uh, and it's, you know, expansion of, and not so much, intensification and expansion of extraction um, and exploitation. Then of course the response came, right? Um, I think that's, uh, that's the, way, the way, one way that I make sense of it, which is the way I, I, I'm trying to, because I decided that it's time to be a little bit optimistic about things because <laughs> things are so bad. <laughs> um, we have to not forget, um, that actually the gains that we had um, in the past, I could say even 50 years, even if many of them think in terms of also in, in, in the US of the civil rights even, uh, that even if some of them, if not many of them have been lost, something changed along the time that, you know, we are ready for responding. That is, um, um, yeah, that's what I, um, I think I saw. But I'd like to, to, to say a little bit something about, you know, how, I mean, bringing it all together, how it's possible, how we could begin to think about all of this complexity, right? Because I think it's thinkable. Um, it may take some adjustments uh, to how we think about things, very profound, profound adjustments, but I think, I think it is thinkable. Um, and one of the ways in which I, yeah, I try to make, to make sense of it is um, we could look at this moment, one of, a, you know, one of a radical reconfiguration, one in which a radical reconfiguration uh, of the political is possible. Um, and, and that radical reconfiguration I think it is signaled precisely by the, the fact that the ratio is coming to the center of the political discourse. I mean, we can think that, that um, Trump, for instance, has campaigned on, his, well, implicitly, but also explicitly on the basis of white supremacy, right? And then, and he's still, do, he's still doing it in a way. Um, 
and then at the same time, we can see how his administration is failing to protect U.S. Americans uh, of color. But anyway, so but or I think what I'm trying to say is that we, I mean, if we use Foucault's framework, for instance, because it's um, allows it to organize, we can see with um, with the global pandemic, we can see the the biopolitical role of the state, like how the U.S., for instance, is in Brazil, are failing to play. Uh, their, um, the, the governments are failing to play their biopolitical role, which has to do with protecting the health of the population, right? There's uh, something um, basic, like every other commentary in the media will, will tell us. And then at the same time, we see the state very much, uh, com very comfortable playing its juridical political mode, um, uh, its juridical political role, um, both in, in the usual terms, in, in the string of kill, uh, killings of unarmed black folks that we saw, Breonna Taylor, Floyd, and others, um, but playing the juridical political mode through, um, through the ratio, which is a discipline, is a tool of disciplinary power, right? The tool of produ is a productive tool of, of subjects. So, in a way, I think we, if we, if we for instance, instead of making a choice between, uh, you know, how, how are we to analyze power using, just using Foucault's framework for now, because it's uh, easier uh, to make sense of it. Whether we look at the production of social subjects, which is what, you know, my work kind of does, or we can choose to, to have a discussion about the juridical political moment and see, well, is it Foucault or Dumbin who is right? Um, you know, what kind of biopolitical is that to work here, either one of them. I think it's time, this time is asking us to bring, to look at all faces of the state. Um, and in doing so, also attend to the different ways in which it, it does, the work it does, for and with global capital, and not only global capital uh, in its financial uh, way of, ways of accumulating and, uh, but also in its uh, the extractive aspect of global capital that it brings um, that I think it brings it all together. Um, and um, there was something else, but I, I forgot. <laughs> no, that's really helpful. There's a, I guess two questions I had to follow up to that um, because the um, you had talked about the kind of racial disparities in the deadliness of the pandemic, for example, which of course is um, you know, infinitely or, you know, exponentially intensified by the state policies that have been um, under the management or mismanagement of the pandemic. Um, there's, and there have been, you know, interesting conversations uh, and kind of debates among thinkers about to what degree um, looking at those disparities through uh, the question of kind of a racial disparitarian kind of framework might deflect attention from the fact that, for example, in the US, Latinx and uh, black workers are more likely to be, you know, essential workers or more likely to have poor health care because they're more likely to be poor, for example. Um, and I'd like to just hear what, what you might, you know, or, or for example, another kind of way that that debate has been framed is to say that looking at this um, police killings, you know, exclusively through a question of race might, uh, doesn't work to explain, um, the, is a different kind of explanation than to say, well, this is the kind of repression that's used against surplus workers who, you know, who are being disciplined into labor or being kind of prevented from rebelling within a context of unprecedented inequality. So, and I think this is kind of one way to kind of ask you more about how you would understand the racial or racialization in relationship to class um, and the kind of questions that you've been, you, you issues you've already addressed. Um, yeah, that's, um, I think that's related to what I was saying. I mean, I don't think, I think it's related to what I was saying initially from the very beginning about the ways in which the, the concept of racism um, actually why it's so it's so unhelpful right because you you can i mean you go back you, you go back but you could go not so far away back 
to Stuart Hall's uh, writing on uh, writings in the 80s, 70s, uh, Cedric Robinson's, um, but not so much back as to the 30s and 20s, where actually you had the global mobilization, which was anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist, and anti-racist, um, like George Patterson, uh, Du Bois was involved, Paul Robinson, so, you know. So that, that division, um, I think has a lot, also a lot to do with the ways in which during, during the Cold War, that is this, the, ideolo the ideological division uh, between, you know, liberalism in the US and, and socialism um, also was intersected, that division was intersected by a civil rights movement that somehow created these two levels, right? As if you, that is a, two organizations of, of the political while the US was going, uh, you know, articulating a liberal anti-communist discourse going this way. It was also articulating a social racial inclusion discourse and practice going in a different way. Um, and that I think uh, I, we find that was also followed by um, the 1980s and that was my generation and our, and our activation of cultural difference and racial difference and gender and sexuality as political signifiers. And all of a sudden we have these two, um, as if we, we had two political texts that would, should never, um, that had nothing to do with each other. While at the same time, every time we, one would look at even, and then even in the US, one would, would look at how the state responded to, um, to protest or organizing from people of color that addressed it directly, thinking about the Black Panthers, the American Indian movement, then it responded with the same violence that it responded to uh, you know, move organizations on the basis of class or, or economic dispossession, right? So every time you look at, so I think um, what what we 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 need to attend to, and and that's what I try to do in my in my work, uh, is for instance the the ways in which um, raciality, as you know, since it's it, it was um, these apparatus was assembled in the 19th century, it has consistently worked with, with capital. So um, in the, speaking about the history, the history of, of the US, you know, so the end of reconstruction, for instance, had so much to do, uh, all to do with an agreement that facilitated the, 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 the entry, the expansion of capitalism into the South in the US. And though that, that end of that, the, that, that was not only the, an end at an attempt at addressing the effects of slavery over the black population, but it was also, it also opened up for uh, the proliferation of racial violence throughout the South and even also uh, the North of the West. But definitely not only Jim Crow, could, not only legal, right? Legal exclusion, but also lynching um, in the US. And it's all tied to a decision that had to do with the building of railroads in, in the south of the US. And, and, the US and, and, and the US federal government absolutely abandoning the southern black population to, you know, to the whims of, um, of southern state. Um, and, there's, and there's also a situation that brought about uh, a wa waves of migration from uh, the South to the Northern US that created a whole set of problems. So I think if we, if we attend to this, these two moments, how economic decisions have been consistently racial decisions, and it's not only at this uh, level of a particular a nation state, but I think globally, um, then it's, it won't be very difficult. But what we, but what we, um, if that requires that we lift our social categories, you know, the ones that describe my institute, for instance, and, um, and do not, I mean, that we lift them and, and also open them up 
to look at the mechanisms uh, and the processes and the discourses that enter in that contraction. Um, and, then I'll, and then one way of doing it is actually also looking at when, when and how they are deployed um, in to justify political decisions, et cetera. No, thank you. And um, that I think leads, and you, this is something you leads to one other thing I wanted to ask about, which you've already been speaking to, but um, is the question of how you have explicitly, you know, been working on and theorizing race and um, within a global context. And if you could talk a bit, a bit more about like the kinds of concepts and methods that you think are necessary to be thinking about it beyond the kind of you know, specific national cultures. And also, you know, how it can therefore be understood or how an analysis of race is relevant to thinking about international, internationalist political strategies or struggles. Um, so to, to the first part of your, of your question, what I what I have been trying to um, to think about, or maybe inviting others to think about, which is something that I have been uh, obviously, as I mentioned, talking about, is um, precisely the ways in which uh, we cannot and should not keep. Um, maintain that separation. Uh, let me use um, the social categories to, 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 to refer to them. So that separation between, between race and class. Um, now to do, to do that, in addition to then um, assembling these, this formulation of the racial as a uh, productive um, productive, as a modern productive category, I'm, I have been also trying to uh, attend to, to the work that then the racial or raciality has done um, for, the state, for the state capital. One of the things that I, I have seen and, um, and the piece I sent is very much um, about it, is to show how it on the one hand, allows for it, it immediately justifies racial 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 signification. Immediately, <coughs> excuse me, allows for the justification of actions and policies that are not <coughs> that are not um, that are otherwise unacceptable. And in doing so, on the other hand. It allows for the activation of what I, I like to call the, the colonial machinery of power, the machinery of total violence. Um, <clears throat> so now you 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 see you 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 see that that happening in, in in decisions regarding you know police killing of unarmed black persons, but you also see that happening in the sites of extraction uh, where decisions which are global, regional, but also national and local decisions, thinking, thinking about the DRC, uh, Congo DRC here, decisions that on the decisions and, and mechanisms and, and infra, an infrastructure, a colonial infrastructure that allows for the continuation of extraction while doing at the same time as it's feeding uh, a war, um, you know, a local war, apparently the local war, that undermines any attempt at organizing against that extraction. So Congo DRC has been going on for a long time. So then we saw the division of the country along those lines, uh, you know, the violent division of the country while, you know, the extraction of oil and other resources what is still uh, taking place. Um, so I was thinking for instance, um, so that, so, so you take police brutality in the US, you take uh, the colonial wars being fought in, 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 in the African continent, and you, you take the daily uh, dealing with uh, narco traffic and, and militias in Brazil or in, or in Mexico and in other places. Those are all tied to 
on the one hand, uh, extraction, and then on the other hand, also this, the fact that this moment, you know, there is a surplus population, right? That capital doesn't, uh, doesn't need anymore, and that could very easily organize, the, organize against it. And instead, they are involved dealing with those local, you know, whether you call it drug violence or, or civil war, um, extraction, expropriation, um, both of them remain. Uh, anyway, again, I got lost in my answer. But <laughs> no, no, I, I mean, I think I, I, I really agree with you. And you could see the same, uh, you know, the thing with the, the way that the indigenous in Brazil are, you know, obviously treated as expendable in relationship to the pandemic. And that works very well for the desire to take their land. And, the, you know, that's it, you really or the state violence against water protectors in the state. So I think that's a really, I think that makes a lot of sense. Do you think that um, in terms of responding to these, this, I mean, once we can see that these things are all, these are connected globally, um, how do you think that an analysis of the way that race figures in to the extraction, exploitation, dispossession, might um, impact the way we would think about a response against these? Um, see, the problem, um, I think maybe what I have been talking about is precisely why it's so dif difficult to do it, isn't it? Um, because we can have these, we, we do have these moments like, you know, you know this, this horrible coincidence of, uh, breathing, a theme of breathing in relationship to COVID-19 and, um, and the chokehold. But it's, um, yeah, <laughs> that's when I'm not, that's when I'm not optimistic. And that, that's when I, I think that the, the shift, even we have to be able to imagine um, the world differently, to image the world differently in order to be able to design the strategies that will, um, you know, that will address the, 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 the deepest and, and more entrenched uh, dimensions of this, you know, this working of global capital with racial and, uh, and, then, and then other elements. So, um, yeah. It's, uh, I've, been, uh, yeah, I've, been, I've been thinking, I've been thinking about it. So that is a, that is a, that is a metaphysical challenge in that. And that's why the choking there, I, I can't breathe works because it gives you an image that you, you, it, it totally, uh, it, it bypasses all the conceptual and commonsensical, you know, understanding that make it difficult to organize both locally and, um, and then internationally. So that is, that is we need a shift at, um, at the level of the imagination. And then, and then of course, you know, the theoretical and, and more practical aspects of it, in a way, will make things, because, because, the, connection, because the, the, the threads are there, they're out there and we can see them. Um, we just cannot bring them together. So there's a difference between seeing, you know, it's like the, the manifold, the manifold as the philosophers like to say, but then you need the imagination to bring those things together. And then under one, one, one descriptor, and I think we given, you know, just looking at the uprisings now, um, to me, it's very, it's very evident, right? I mean, you don't need to tell the folks in the streets now, they know exactly they're acting before a, a, a knowledge of, of the connections that is given by what happens and not by how we understand things, right? Um, these may be, they, it may be, I think that's consistent. I mean, it's being, you know, like just for the time being, it has this kind of uh, protests have not, um, lasted for too long. Um, so 
I think what I'm trying to say, and I'm not saying it immediately because I was trying to figure out a way of getting there without just saying it. I think, um, of course, we always need critique, but it, to face the, the, the present circumstances, we need a jump from, you know, from the imagination to action, right? Um, we need to figure out that. And then now is, you know, for, for so many decades, we have, oh, even before, we think of the political as always tied to particular kind of organizing under certain principles and informed by a certain understanding of what's going on. <laughs> um, and then I'm saying it's like, maybe um, we have to do the work of undoing. Um, there is a lot of undoing work to be done. And then at the same time, um, we got a batch and on, and on the imagination ability to not to grasp those horrible, uh, painful circumstances, um, you know, co coincidences, the choking, the chokehold and, and the virus. Um, that's the best answer I can give you now. Maybe in a week, it's going to be, I'll be more optimistic. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a, a dynamic situation where, you know, thinking, I'm probably all thinking about now. Um, I know I want to open up for questions soon, but I first wanted to ask you one other question that was more specifically about um, the article. Um, so, what you you ended it um, well? What, um, you ended it with uh, this very you know powerful statement about how a reservoir a reservoir of racial knowledge um, naturalizes the systemic violence or the total violence, as you talk about, that afflicts the economically dispossessed urban and glo global regions where the racial subaltern live and die. And as seen in that statement, but also throughout the article, you um, pay a lot of attention to space and the way that um, ideologies of space, or you might use another term to, to, to talk about that. That's how I think I understand it, but how the racial as entwined as it is with ideologies about criminality and security or insecurity are not only applied to particular subjects or groups, but also to certain spaces. And I was, um, such as those spaces that have been produced by planned dispossession and disinvestment. Um, so I wanted to just ask you what, whether it pertains to the article or but to your work in general, what this attention to space helps us see. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the, the attention to space actually came out, I think two things. On the one hand, um, the more, um, the more analytical, um, you know, trajectory of trying in, in toward the global idea of race as I was trying to, to answer the question, what's the role of racial difference in modern thought? And that's in the reference is a, is a reference, to, reference to exteriority, the exteriority of the body uh, versus the mind and the exteriority of space versus um, time, which is described. Um, on the one hand, at that level. On the other hand, uh, because of this mapping and because that concept comes, uh, emerges after 300 years of, um, of coloniality, then, um, I mean, if you look at the racial knowledge in, in its first uh, articulation, we see that, that it, maps, it maps the globe precisely by connecting particular bodies, regions, with mental capacity or moral, um, moral attributes. So the concept itself does that work. And then we look at the sociological texts, which are the ones about which I, I talk in the piece. I think that's a uh, hand number three. We see that sociology has also mapped uh, the urban space racially. And that's how we talk about the, the, the urban space in, um, uh, in regard, in regards to the US, you know, it's racialized totally. <laughs> um, but then the, the fourth hand is actually thinking from Brazil, where, you know, where one of the main challenge, I mean, there are two challenges. One, the race and class explanation, right? Saying that, you know, poverty in Brazil, everything is tied to uh, economic aspects, not racial colonial ones. But then at the same time that 
in Brazil to use a term that I also usually don't don't use, but but the racial what racial has done primarily is a racializing of the space, uh, racializing terms, uh, racializing of is a racializing of spaces that are also defined socioeconomically. So one of the ways in which I I was able to counter uh, what was back then. The, the prevailing description of racial subjugation in Brazil, or actually the argument that there is no racial subjugation in Brazil, was precisely by describing the, the for instance, the, the, the favela itself as a racial space and not only as an economic space. And the way through which I did mo most of the description was precisely looking at racial violence or the state violence in those, in, 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 in those, um, in those areas which are you know, called zones of violence, um, et cetera. So the, I have all these reasons, but I should, maybe I should have started from the first one because I think that's what I got, I got there, trying to, how, do, how to describe racial subjugation in Brazil. Um, and then it, once I attended to the racial, to the, how the racial is deployed in the description of you know, space, then it becomes very uh, explicit. Uh, and answering the question of, well, you know, we have uh, white people who live in the favelas in Brazil, and they they may be they may be killed, but it's but the blackness of that space is what produced them as political subjects, and not the color of their skin. Yeah. I think that that makes um, so much sense, and I it, I do research also in Argentina where it's quite similar, like the the villas the slums there are also racialized in a way. Um, so I, I know that everybody has uh, questions. Thank you so much, Denise, for all of these answers. This has been such an interesting conversation. And even though I'd like to ask you a lot of other things, I want to open it up to questions from everybody else. So um, you can either, you know, use the raise your hand using the Zoom feature or put your name in the chat and I'll just take um, stack of as you know, as you raise your hand to, to speak. Okay, Scott, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks for the talk. And I, um, I guess I have like two questions that I think are related. Um, so we read this piece about Amadou Diallo and it's obviously resonant with today. So I was I was kind of wondering what you think we can like learn from that event um, in relation to, I mean, I don't know, repeated history of police murders of black people um, and the like spectacle of it. Um, is it a repetition? Are there different differences that are important and worth noting? And then in relation to that, I'm sort of interested in your thoughts on like the language or discourse of like a protest as though way of um, conceiving what happens after that um, versus like uprising or rebellion or something like that? Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I think that I feel, th yeah, I'm <laughs> just thought for a moment I didn't have my sound on. Uh, thank you, Scott, for the, for the question. I think there are a few things that I wanted to highlight in that, in that piece um, in the scene of nature. Uh, of course, the, 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 it is about the repetition of the scene of violence, but it's more, I think the piece is more so about the fact that um, what brings the scene about precedes it and it is outside of it. Um, and it is outside of it, you know, it's on, it, is, um, it precedes it both um, in terms at the level of the common sense, you no, know, about so the hands talking about the jurors them, themselves, and then how, and then in relation to that, how social scientific knowledge, knowledge in general is so much tied, tied to that. But it's also it also precedes in terms of how the 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 courts, not the state, both in you know as law enforcement and as the court is also prepared for that moment, right? the decision to acquit or the decision even not to charge is already prepared, is there, uh, it's given. So I was, um, that's one of the things I was trying to do. But what, you know, 
that piece, I'll, I'll talk about the up uprising and the protest. And, um, so that piece, I, I wrote it back in 2002. And then, um, and I presented it at some critical law conferences. I present, I think, presented it maybe three times, one conference and then two, two talks. And, um, and then when I was writing toward the global idea of race, I mean, changing my dissertation into, into the book, I have it in the, before the text. So I described the scene, but I could not, I, but I decided not to publish um, the piece until 2017 when somebody asked me for a piece and I said yes, and then I didn't have time to prepare it. So I said, oh, I have this one and, 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 that, and that it goes. So, and I'm, I'm saying that, that I preceded the final version of Toward the Global Idea of Race, precisely because also to make sense of that, for that piece to make sense, I had to go through a whole analysis of, um, of why, for why, you know, that, that scene has already to take place in, in, at the level of the common sense and also at the level of, uh, of the institution. Uh, the, yeah, the, the elements of the state as an institution um, that are involved. But anyway, so, um, so in a way, I think what I'm trying to say is that what I would like folks to get from that piece is what is the whole critique that is intolerable, but go by the other ways. But um, now in terms of the protest and um, the difference between protests and uprisings, um, it is, um, it's interesting because also when we think in terms, so uprisings, they, they have these, you know, they, in, in our description of them, they, 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 they seem to be something that just, uh, you know, came out, but there is always an element of, there is always an analysis and an element of um, or organizing that, you know, then comes out at, at you know, at some moment, it, um, it comes out. Now the question, I think the main question for me now is whether the protests we are, um, you know, that are happening now, whether they will, you know, as because they, they come out as they come initially as protests, wh whether if they hold on for a time, then we actually have an uprising. Um, and that is something, um, yeah, that we can't, we can't, we can't say now. Um, my pessimistic side keeps asking what happened to Occupy. Uh, my optimistic side says, oh, it's coming after Occupy, right? Maybe some lessons were, um, were learned. And, my, and there is another side that actually wonders whether or not um, protest, protesting and along with the repression are not again now part of the will not become a crucial part of the juridical juridical political political management that the state uh, does of its populations they may just keep a you know keep us out in the streets anyway because you know <laughs> um so we don't, we don't know so that's why i was thinking that there may it may be a radical reconfiguration um you know um because there has been so much investment in policing, in training and equipment, and you know, who knows? I think um, Constanza was next. Yes. Okay. Hello, everybody. Hi, Denise. Hi. In in your article, you argue that certain sociological mappings rewrite the racial as a tool of social scientific knowledge in such a way that police violence and mur murder become the only possible outcome of a situation, right? Mm -hmm. And I believe that another way to put that is to say that the hegemonic tendency in social sciences contributes to the reproduction of systemic relations of domination, in this case, racial relations. And that by constructing an event as a so social situation, critical interpretations are blocked that social sciences under an empiricist and idealist viewpoint state, well, these are the facts, so this is what you call the, the, ra the rational decision to make given certain facts. 
And I feel that your article points toward this direction to, to say that the problem is not so much about, or not mainly about judging a certain action, which would be part of an objective situation, but about thinking about the effects, the ideological effects, the productiveness that you mentioned before of empiricism. And the way I see it, it is about changing the terrain itself where the debate is held and about critiquing the basis of empiricism to show that the scene of nature, correct me if I am wrong, is not natural, it is not necessary. And maybe my question is a bit ambitious, but which strategies do you think that we can apply or create for such a task to show that there is a, there is a productive character in social sciences or that social research is itself productive? Um. Yes, I couldn't. I could not agree more with um, with, with the reading um, of the argument. Um, I hmm, to your question, I think it depends on the level at which you want to um, to advance. Maybe not so much to advance the um, the argument, but the level at which you want to actually counter. Um, social scientific knowledge, but also, you know, modern knowledge, knowledge in general. Um, because we, 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 can, we can begin from the beginning and say that nature is not natural, right? There is no such a thing as, as nature uh, and has never been philosophically and all the scientific, all scientific, every scientific project from physics through anthropology. Uh, they all presuppose that even though they, when they, when they come out then and describe, they naturalize in that sense of being natural, of being given, right? So there is so much to be said about the ways in which the empirical is a product of the tools that are deployed and the formulations that inform, um, that inform our, um, you know, how we go about describing them or justify our uses of that. So, that that is at one level uh, and then but then that is i think even more abstract level at which um even without talking about nature even before these um you know the creation of nature and then of in, and then of course of it not being natural that is a certain image of the world in which the human is always already standing there before whatever it is you know before whatever it, that is there, that exists in a way that it's, um, the human is always standing there with, a, uh, with, a, with an intention, so already apprehending whatever is there, um, with, a, with, a, with a design, which should be intervention, emulation, understanding, in, um, intervention, understanding, emulation, like copying and reproducing that. That's more of a metaphysical, would be called, I don't know, more of a, of a metaphysical instance in there. So those are like the more abstract ones. Um, but I think that maybe there are these more um, immediate tactical uh, you know, strategies, that uh, tactics, not strategies, that can be employed in terms of pointing to those moments where the moment where the natural is being created as such. Um, and that's what I try to do in the piece by using necessities, the, 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 you know, highlighting necessity because necessity is um, the, the idea that describes the natural. I mean, that tracing back even to the Middle Ages, not only in modern, in modern thinking. Um, so attending to those moments when the natural, when, when it's like now, uh, since since the crisis, the, uh, the global economic crisis, 2007-2008, we could see uh, how the economy became a necessity. Uh, you are probably, most of you are too young to, to remember that, but it's everything is to save the economy. It's like, can't exist without the economy. And now we see it again, and then, but then now that, has been so naturalized that we actually accept the fact that decisions are made that will kill people but will save the economy, right? But if we could follow the past 10 years or so, the naturalization, the 
this naturalization of the economy as something without which, you know, life on earth wouldn't, wouldn't be possible. So I think appointing to those moments when, when something is said to be necessary, when sacrifices have to be made, if not, everything will be destroyed. I think that's a moment where the natural is being created. Um, and we can see them. Um, okay, uh, Jennifer. Hi, uh, thank you so much for all of this and, and for being with us here today. Um, I, my question was about the terms or the ideas of disposability versus obliteration. Um, I know I liked what you were saying about this distinction between a kind of hierarchizing and a, and a logic of obliteration. And then we also kind of talked about surplus populations and the idea of certain groups being disposable. And I was just wondering if you could elaborate on how you saw the relationship between <laughs> the logic of disposability and the logic of obliteration. And like, what, how does, what happens in the moment? Do we switch between those? Is there something that happens where we switch from this kind of um, inattentive, passive logic of, of disposability to a kind of active, murderous, um, logic of obliteration, or are they, do they work together? Are they, are they happening at the same time? That's, uh, I'm going to stop talking because mm -hmm. it's getting less articulate as this question goes. No, no, actually you'll, you know, because you're bringing it <laughs> closer to this, to the complex, isn't it? Because I think, um, they're part of the same, is the same continuum. If you think of disposability in terms of, um, as indifference, right? is indifference to, to certain conditions. Right? Um, it is, I, I usually refer to that in terms of um, racial violence, it's, it's enacted in the killing and the letting die, right? So disposability is in that, in the letting die, the indifference towards uh, the death of, of certain persons. Um, that's how I would, I would see them. I think they're together. Jacob is next. Cool, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, my question concerns kind of the, the contemporaneous uh, situation and some of the comments you made about it. So uh, when considering uh, this possibility uh, for the political to be reconfigured, uh, I wonder if you think there's uh, any value in kind of prioritizing uh, the discursive uh, epistemic uh, dimension or uh, the like material substratum of capital? Because it seems to me that uh, there are there are elements of the protests uh, that are not reducible to uh, the discursive. Uh, kind of function. I'm thinking of uh, like looting of targets uh, and uh, like the burning of the third precinct. So uh, do you think that uh, if there's kind of a site of uh, the, that could change the and reconfigure the political, if it would be like reducible to either the discursive or the material? Um. So I, I didn't want to talk about <laughs> my generational reasons not to use racism, but I can talk about um, being of a generation um, in Brazil, but not only in Brazil, in which we, uh, or in which we, we, we thought about the site of struggle as having all those different things, you know, faces, and then there was ideological struggle. And then otherwise, you know, the more active we go to the streets moment of the struggle, but we should be prepared to, you know, to struggle on all fronts. Um, and I think, and I still, that keeps me in my generation. I think we need a critique. Um, and then, and then the strat strategies, whatever will be designed in terms of action, will be designed by a generation according to, you know, whatever, <laughs> what's possible, what's being done. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, so for sure, I don't, I think, you know, 
all the fronts should be, uh, you know, they are there, they define the political anyway. Um, so I don't think that is a matter of one or, or the other, but then the how, I think it's up to every generation and to, you know, decide what, how they're going to do it. Um, that's the answer I can have. <laughs> Thank you. And Jackson is next. Hi, thank you so much. I, I learned so much both from the conversation and from the article. Um, in the ongoing protests, I've been very interested in this strategy of, of awareness raising, where we've been asked to repeat the names of victims of police killing. So I was curious, as far as your work on um, racialized subject formation and things like this go, uh, what you would make of uh, of this this strategy of of asking people to to think repeatedly about the names of victims and how this pr protest strategy that relies on this on this uh, you know very subjective element of specific victims relates to to awareness raising as to some of the more uh, structural or systemic issues at hand. Yeah. So say say her name or say say his name, say their name. Um, I can see my students, uh, you know, saying that, you know, actually, call, you know, being at the forefront of, of making that demand. And I, I, I don't think it is, um, again, I don't see an opposition, you know, the structural and then this subjective. But I see in, in, in the call to say the name, it's, um, it is the ethical, it is an ethical, one right um, because if you describe racial subjugation as primarily uh, in terms of you know the mode of of um, as carrying primarily the de dehumanization right uh, and dehumanization at the individual level in terms of the moment of killing and dehumanization at the group level in terms of the conditions under which people live being disposable uh, whatever so when you when you call for the name you are calling you're calling for empathy right you're, you're making it is an ethical gesture it's not we're not talking about numbers right we're not talking about how many people have been killed by the police or, not, or how many people have been killed by COVID-19 and this, you would actually say actual people with names, last names, which bring them, brings with it their family, not only their family in terms of the last name, but their family in terms of the first name and, that, and the effective aspect of it. I think that's the, what, um, that's how I read that call. It's a call, it's a calling for hu humanization, um, rehumanization that has a lot to do with you know you know the the ways in which the political of this generation of you know your generation of this moment also carries these carries both this ethical dimension and then an affective dimension uh, that for instance for my generation that affective dimension wasn't there uh, right we were trying to raise consciousness teaching people about capitalism and how bad it was and you know let's go for the revolution because it is a generation before 89. So we were thinking about the revolution back then. Um, okay, uh, Leah is next. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that was great. Um, my question is, uh, I really liked your use of, of the term racialization rather than a racism because of the way that in saying the word, it insists on the active production of the idea of the concept. And I, I, I would like to ask, are there other forms of exclusionary or, and again, as, as I think Jacob just said, uh, I, I, I like, or, or uh, Jen maybe said, um, I like this term very much too, the obliterative logics that, um, that you mentioned. Are there other forms of these exclusionary or obliterative logics for which you typically make similar language moves to insist on the same quality of active production and construction of the subject and of the logic? Uh, or are there other identifying labels for which you would reject making an analogous language move? Uh, in terms of, well, it's not, um, hmm. 
that's a good that's a good question because I think they all, if you think in terms of the social categories, gender, sexuality, um, they the gender and sexuality. I find that you you got you get moments. They also have this you know this processual. It's always happening, right? That is, it's not that it's given. Um, the modality of subjugation, you know, uh, thinking in terms of gender, it is always, you know, whether it is um, uh, inter thinking in terms of of cis, cis women, like in terms of a reference to the domestic, thinking in terms of trans people, the misnaming, the, you know, that is always a moment of, so you, you it's, yeah, I, I think it's consistent. Class is, is, um, is one, <laughs> of such categories, which may be because it is, in a way, in terms of the, the social scientific critical apparatus is the first one that seems not to do that of you, you are not being, you know, laboring, right? That is a, it, it seems to hold on to the dichotomic because maybe because of Marx framing of it in terms of possesses the means of production, blah, 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 and possesses nothing but labor power, right? Um, that's the only one that I don't think, but the social categories, and it may be because like um, in the case of race, the descriptions of their operations have been, you know, placed in the superstructural, like this, you know, the ideological and cultural, it's all, it seems processual, it's part of the operating, of the social that these modalities of subjugation is they're always being you don't have one or the other um but in, in the case of class i don't yeah that's the only one that i can't think of it you know along the same lines great uh, ellie is next i hope i'm saying your name right it's eli but it's okay, okay everyone, sorry. everyone speaks spanish says ellie everyone speaks english <laughs> um, eli, so it's, it's really fine either way um, okay, so thank you very much. Um, I, my question, um, I, I suppose actually sort of takes us back a few minutes when, we, when there was an exchange between um, Denise and Constanza. Um, so I, I actually, uh, I had a few thoughts while you were um, discussing this question on the scene of nature. So I'm in a sense sort of also drawing more heavily on the, on the article than I am on our, our conversation so far. Um, and I, I suppose I have a question about sort of how we can apprehend this question of the scene of nature or, or of the natural in general. And I'm, I'm incredibly sympathetic to Constanza's point about the need to sort of destabilize what are ultimately, you know, sort of empiricist or, and, and positive, just crudely positivist and, and by, <laughs> by extension idealist, you know, sort of pretensions of contemporary, you know, uh, uh, social sciences. But, you know, and, and perhaps this is because my experience is primarily in philosophy, I, I wonder if um, there isn't in some sense a moment of concession, if you will, um, to, to this sort of terrain of, you know, of empiricism to say, well, you know, there in, is in fact nothing natural, right? Um, and the reason I sort of raise this question is that in philosophy, I think, you know, the disposition is sort of um, the opposite, right? <laughs> like anti-naturalism, um, sort of, that is the suspension of all claims to any possible naturalness or any natural characteristics of the human being or the world in general. I mean, really, there's been an aversion to that for quite some time. And so I'm wondering if we can't sort of have maybe a more dialectical understanding of the relationship between the natural and sort of its, its and false naturalization, in other words. Because again, I mean, there are perfectly good historical reasons um, to want to, to, to destabilize false naturalizations, especially racialized and gendered ones. Um, but on the other hand, it seems to me we can sort of suspend any and all claims to the natural because those also seem to be the very things that ground our ability to say human beings ought not to be right, uh, you know, either by racialized, gendered or other means, right, murdered, <laughs> exploited, enslaved, and so on. Um, so it seems to me we kind of have, a, I, I'm just sort of wondering if there is a way we can work through this tension, through sort of what is required of us to maintain in order for these claims to sort of still have a basis in something that I think ultimately um, can be uncontroversial, though it historically has not been. Um, and so, yeah, I wonder if we could talk more about this, um, whether or not, you know, we can talk about the dialectic relation between the historical mediation of nature, um, which of course now has taken on an incredibly new significance with 
the climate crisis. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, um, so suspending naturalistic claims is incredibly dangerous at this time for other reasons. But I also wonder about these kind of normative reasons. So could you talk more about, about that? Yeah, so I was, uh, um, if I, if I got exactly where you we are going, because I think there are two things that work, you know, what you're saying, but um, one of one way that I, I would respond to what you're saying, and then in particular, I think you said that the distinction between the natural and the human is what allows us to make claims, ethical claims. Is that what you said? Uh, no, and I, let me, could I reiterate actually? Because yeah, I yeah, don't want to be confused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I actually think that's uh, an incredibly problematic, uh, you know, opposition yeah. as well. What I meant to say is simply that um, if we're sort of suggesting that um, we can no longer make natural claims of any kind, right? as a, in response to false kinds of naturalization or bad immoral, you know, or sort of, again, just ideological forms of naturalization, you know, I, I'm worried about if we sort of are concerned about those ideological naturalizations, whether or not that just is really motivation to suspend naturalistic claims altogether. I wonder if that's not sort of conceding territory to the assumption that empiricism has the right idea about nature, right? In inadvertently, it seems to imply um, that. Okay, so, okay, so let me, um, let me answer you over, over then, and then maybe, and then we can go to the other things you're asking. So when I said when I said that that is the natural is not natural, I was making a joke, but I was also highlighting something um, that uh, yeah that we, that we find in the in the trajectory in the, of modern philosophy, which is. Um, that that is that shift from the natural is the natural is is that which you know the, the that was created by god right the um oh my god the the god that was the primary force the secondary the secondary laws secondary laws that was created by the secondary laws of god or, or such a thing i forgot now and then and then i'm thinking of the kantian kant description of 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 nature as being just those rules um through which you know the mind actually apprehends what's whatever whatever it's there so and that is the name for nature and then you get to hegel and then nature becomes just that site of alienated spirit where the spirit like transcendental reason has not yet come to recognize itself so in that sense that i'm saying that the natural is not natural right the natural is not given before some whether it's the divine author and ruler or what's the, whether, whether it's spirit, whether are the apparatus of the understanding um, and the pure sensibilities. So that's at the level at which I'm saying that. So I'm not talking about the naturalization of gender race because that's like, that comes way later and it becomes, that naturalization already takes into account that view of the, na the natural being produced um, in um, you know through uh, the as a divine or or the transcendental the transcendental natural um, so that okay so and then <laughs> um, I think the second part of my question was um, was really just about sort of is there sort of a more yeah can we sort of talk about this problem of countering even this right what, what i would just call a reified because i think this is just reified nature right these are not actually claims about nature in in some rigorous sense i think that they're they're ideological claims about nature but sort of is that distinction something that's um working very very much in your sort of um your description of the scene of nature is that sort of maybe why is that part of how it is framed as a scene i'm just sort of trying to understand the role of you know whether or not we can ever at any well, point with the nature in that mm -hmm. oh. Okay, so okay, so there is this philosophical writing of nature. What I was what I was mentioning it in re, in regards more in regards to the scientific to scientific what I call in the piece scientific universality. But we also find if you look at Locke and Hobbes, you know all these classical texts of uh, political philosophy, that is also this construction of a, such a thing something called the state of nature that is given as a basis for the writing of what the proper policy, a liberal policy would be like. So again, it's a nature that it's not, you know, over there, is a, a nature that it's, um, 
that it's presented, that it's assembled in the same moment and along with what is not nature is assembled. So the scene of nature, scene of nature is a play with both of them. Like scene of nature is a commentary on the state of nature, but thinking of the state, state of nature as constituted through scientific uh, universality. So that's what, I, that's what it stands for. It brings both of them together. Um, um, Anna is next. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for um, speaking us, to us today. And uh, I really enjoyed reading the article. And I wanted to ask about something in the article. Um, it was, I mean, incredibly relevant. And it really resonated with me about what's happening today. But I wanted to take it more in, um, in thinking about time, actually. So one of the elements that struck me was how the scene of nature was how temporality came into play um, in the scene, if you will. So not only the time that it took to shoot Diallo, but the space between the two events, as you talk about, between the cop shooting and the decision to acquit them. And then, but mainly this idea of um, always already. So as you speak about it, already new and already new comes into play all the time. And so I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about um, if and how temporality plays out in your conception of what you term the arsenal of raciality. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it's, um, so the piece shows it explicitly that I'm just saying like time, who cares about time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they always already gives it up. Um, the, um, the very idea of that scene gives it, gives it, gives it up. So instead of answering through the uh, arsenal of raciality, I'll talk about the racial event. Because okay. the racial event um, is, is this, um, it is this phrase, but it's not only a phrase, it does some quite a bit of work for me. But I came up with it, I was, I, I don't know why I was, I had to read by you for something, somebody asked me to do something. And then I said, okay, you know what, let's take care of this event, because I can't take this eventual, eventual subject anymore. So, and then I was thinking, um, primarily about racial violence and the ways in which, um, you know, the, it happens all the time, right? And the decisions are always the same. So what is, what is at work there? And the racial event, um, I did a piece for the Liverpool Biennial, I think two, three, four years ago, which was about, supposed to be about slave traffic. And that's when I actually finally decided to do something about the racial event or that which happens without time. Um, and, uh, and for me, the racial event is a way of um, capturing these, mo these, um, these operations, and I'm, I'm saying an operation without a subject, is a, this operation that brings together, you know, this, many elements of existence, but you know, them organized as symbolic, juridical, ethical, economic. They bring them all together. Um, and you see them coming together in the moment when the decision, whatever decision is to be justified, but usually a decision around the deployment of, um, of racial violence. It is, it is, it is as if, because it is, but then we can always say that everything it is in a way as if um, the racial had this this, uh, this ability to resolve time, right? To resolve time, not so much in in uh, bringing about something. So it's not a causal relationship, but it's about explaining why something did take place and why it had to take place, why it could not have happened any other way, yeah. and that's the play of necessity. Um, that's the play of, uh, of necessitatis, right? It has to happen, it must happen, it has already happened, that's why it can, could, o could only have happened. Um, so at that level, that, that, that operation is a racial, the racial event, and that's, in a way, it, is, it was already in, 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 in the piece, but I only came up with, um, yeah, I only worked it through, uh, out, um, a bit later, it took me a, a, a while. 
but it is that which happens without time. Because it cannot be in time, because if the ratio were in time, the fundamental differences it supposed to capture and the fundamental differences that allow and justify um, the unthinkable, the unacceptable, they would eventually disappear, right? So every time the ratio enters, the time has to go away. Time cannot stay there. Thank you. Esteban is next. Um, hello. Well, uh, thank you very much for, for the conversation. And well, it, the, the topic is really, really interesting. And well, I have a question about um, what you said uh, at the beginning, um, this distinction between um, the, the hierarchical and well, this, this uh, perhaps more basic non-hierarchical difference where the, the this uh, where the right the rush the the racial is created uh, is produced and reproduced and so on. so so my question is is just well in 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 which sense are are these two uh, levels uh, connected I mean um, so in which way or, or which role role or con either conceptual or social role plays or, or could play this this non hierarchical ideal notion of the right the ratio so mm -hmm. um, so this idea that that no ra the, the ratio is, is just this difference of course as you, as you argue is some, is something is a political conceptual to, uh, tool but what but in another sense, of course, it is already hierarchical. I mean, the, 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 the differentiation itself is already hierarchical. So that would be the question. What role does this ideal difference, differentiation of, of race play in the, the whole systemic, uh, already hierarchical, uh, um, function of the ratio. Okay, um, so maybe you, you could think of it within the, the notion of humanity, um, for instance, which is where the ratio works. It is with the, that, that notion, that principle, actually, I should say, um, that it works. Um, so humanity is one of those 18th century uh, notions, concepts that captured the, the unity of a multiplicity, right? Um, so humanity is one, but then it assumes a plurality in it. So the way it was articulated in the beginning of the 20th century was in terms of human uh, diversity, which is a term that we you know, came back at the end of the last century, and then human um, dignity, okay? So if you, the racial operating within humanity works with both of them. On the one hand, it works with human diversity, recognizing the fact that there are different modes of being human, human beings, collectives, organized, founding collectives, that are very much different, but then they do not, but they, they are, um, um, they are, how do I say, they are, they are displayed, they are classified, if they are classified in a way, so that would, the way it would be um, their mental characteristics, moral and intellectual characteristics. And then you have a hierarchy in which Europe is at the top and, you know, Blacks and the Black Australians are at the bottom. That's a hierarchy from the 19th century. It is there. Now, at the same time, within that notion of humanity, there is a, uh, the notion of dignity, which actually means 
that it is that which cannot be measured, that which is outside of measure, that which has dignity, has an intrinsic value, hence cannot be placed in any, in any hierarchy. When that is activated is when total violence becomes acceptable. Because then it's, there are humans who have dignity and those who don't. And the lives that matter, yeah, those are the lives that have, are protected. And the lives that do not matter are the lives of those who don't have dignity. So it works um, in both, the, yeah, it works in both ways. And that's why I see the two logics operating at the same time. But you can only see them operating in the moment of deployment, in the moment of justification. What kind of meaning, which meaning of, the huma of humanity is being deployed in order to justify what's happened? But when it's ha what happened is killing, then it is dignity. When, I mean, it's not that simple, right? I mean, I'm just explaining it. It's, mu it's much more complex. Um, but that's that is basically the, anal the analysis, how the analysis is done. Thank you. We're getting uh, near the end of our uh, stack. We have two more, um, and we're also getting near to the end of our time. But the next um, person up is Larissa. Hello. Thank you for your talk and for all the interesting points that you presented to us. Um, I really enjoyed the reading. Um, and as an art historian, I really thought of the different ways that the cultural and social response to um, these racial subjugations, but also the violence and oppression um, made me think about um, your reading in a different context in terms of, you know, the art historical context and the removal of certain monuments and memorials. Um, and it, um, just in your text, you said that the killing of a person is a so social event, which somewhat aligns with the social events and the cultural events of removing public monuments. Um, and so as we develop our understanding of the scene of nature, as well as um, the reproduction of racial subjugation, how can we bridge or tie the cultural or social events and responses that refute the scene of nature and the kind of the individual responses that we have as a collective um, or as, you know, just our individual kind of ethical standards push us to respond to um, those things and refute them? Um, so so do you find that there is a disjunction between the two? Um, the no, I just, I thought maybe you could clarify just, um, I don't think there's a disjunction, but I, th I guess what I was trying to say was that sometimes we um, just, uh, as in your text, you know, we, we're seeing the scene of nature kind of play out, but I think there's, there's kind of this typical reaction to want to separate the individual versus kind of the social events happening or a disconnect in trying to understand how they almost tie and bridge together. Yeah, well, I think I try to, um, yeah, I try to call attention to that when I, I, I decided to use the term person instead of, um, instead of subject, which I used for a long time, but for a while I have been, yeah, using person is an old fashioned, complex, complicated, problematic term as bad as the subject, but, it brings you um, both, like it brings you the, the, the ethical, the ethical element, and also the affective element that I was mentioning when answering somebody's question before, right? So, so the person is a social entity, but is a social entity, is a social thing that is tied to the ethical and, and, um, and the affective. And I think that's where it comes together, right? So when you say the name, you say the name and last name of a person. Um, um, yeah, I think that's <laughs> how it would answer. I have one more question on Stack. If, and so this is kind of a last call if anybody else wants to raise your hand or put your name in. But the next and maybe last person is um, Trung. Thank you, thank you. Um, thank you so much for, for the reading and, and for spending your time with us. Um, so my, my question is related to um, your frame of, instead of having, um, you, or using the concept of racism and how problematic that is, has been incredibly helpful for me to think about um, racial trauma and racial 
healing as a concept that is are, are two constructs that are um it it's like sort of on the rise and trendy right in, in social sciences and particularly in in psychology um and how problematic it is because it is again underneath the 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 way problems are identified is only under the umbrella of racism and racism alone it does not connect with anything else um, um including uh, global capitalism or class struggle, any of that is completely um, excluded from, 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 from that. And how problematic it is that, again, social sciences using a supposedly universal concepts, like they, of course in a design a survey, right, uh, some way to measure racial trauma. Um, and to lead to that, the antidote to that is racial healing. And even within that, it's almost as if um, the scientist, supposedly, right, the expert would decide where the wound is or what are the problems um, through taking the voices of, of people who are living underneath that. And so much layers to it that is completely ignored. Um, and again, it, it's because you are using racial trauma and then racial healing, then um, it's only about race and it, it's purely somehow psychological and it doesn't relate to the fact that people don't have food to eat or um, violence or people are dying. Um, and there's such a rush to healing, right? Because um, COVID-19 is happening. We, we can't stay in this supposedly traumatized um, place for too long. So we have to start healing, we have to start holding hope. Um, with no substance or content or changes to the material reality of of anyone, um, so I'm I'm really interested in since you sort of which switch from racism into racialization or the racial per se. Um, I'm wondering what's your thought on you know the whole racial trauma and racial healing, um, and, and what would be the reframe of that if we use racialization instead. Okay, the second part of the question, I'll leave it to you and the others who are working because <laughs> I cannot dare to say how <laughs> we should reframe that. But I can say that we should definitely um, not make use of, because, in, you know, in addition to, you know, the, the, the disavow, the post, maybe even lies, so just a postponement of any engagement with, um, with the material conditions. Uh, that is also the fact that it also resolves within a particular group, right? So if you look at the surveys on racial trauma, you're gonna look at uh, African-Americans, Latinx people, Asian-Americans, right? and then look at the blah, blah, blah. So we know already verifies the whole, it's already the whole, already does the work, uh, you know, of racial subjugation uh, all over again. Um, so it is, it is problematic in both senses in which the work it does in terms of reproducing um, racial differences that are then used for justifying precisely the kind of juridical economic processes that we, we have been um, talking about. I think that's, that would be my response. <laughs> Esteban, do you have a second question is, or was your hand up from before? Yeah, I, I have a, a new question, very brief. If, if no one else has another, I, I wants to, to ask a question first. Okay, so, okay um, well, it's a very simple, uh, well, it's a question about uh, well, the, the concept of causality, because you mentioned it, I think a couple of times, times, but uh, somehow avoiding it, because of course you want to, you, you have um, this diff very different kinds of explanations and conditions, very different notions of, of uh, explanation, but well, that, that would be, what, what do you understand what, um, um, with, um, causal explanation when you want to av avoid it in order to explain this phenomenon. Okay. 
Okay, so I'll give you my secret. My, my trick is to remember Aristotle's four causes, formal, efficient, material, and final. And the causality I'm usually, I usually say I'm trying to avoid is the efficient one, which is the one that governs modern science since Newton and hasn't totally gone away. And then I play sometimes with the formal one. <laughs> and then sometimes as I was talking about now about ethics, you know, I know I'm, I'm in the region that's covered by the final causes. Um, and I keep trying to avoid the efficient one as much as I can, even though language sometimes forces us to use it, to go there. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I think that is all of our questions. Thank you so much, Denise, for your talk and for um, the, the article that you shared with us. And thank you, everyone, for the fantastic questions. This has been such an interesting conversation. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And thanks, everyone, for the questions and for being here. That was really fun. <laughs>